I'm Stephanie DeBruzzo, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Damien and Anne. Well, welcome back to another episode of You Might Know Her From. With Damien and Anne. I am Damien. I'm Anne. Welcome back to our show where we look into each other's eyes over Zoom, sometimes in person these days, now that case counts continue to go down. And we talk about our aging bodies, what we're into pop culture, and then we interview an actress each episode. That's what we do here. So welcome back to the show. Okay, one of the things that I've gotten into recently, I don't know if I told you this, is like vintage glassware. And we were talking about this recently because when I was over at your house, you had bought these like vintage tumblers, like Muppet tumblers, which I was so charmed by because I love those old glasses that have like cartoon characters on them. I have a whole set of juice glasses that are Archie comics because that's what I grew up with. And you turned around to me as you were handing me a Muppet glass and you were like, you identified as animal, right? And I was like, I absolutely did. Uh-huh. And I completely forgot that I was an animal person as a teenager. I had like a shirt from Gadzooks that I had <laughs> bought that had just a huge picture of animal's face. I don't know what it is, but I find myself identifying with the essence of animal. I'm not a drummer. I don't have great rhythm, but I do feel a kinship with them. I don't know. Is like Animal a man? Like, I feel like that's what I liked about Animal. It's like, I wasn't quite sure what was happening. I don't think Animal is a woman or a girl, but I think there okay. is a level of androgyny to them, which I am into. Love their, love their frame. Love their enormous yeah, their hair a, and their tiny their frame. Their aesthetic is, I would argue, similar to yours. Thank you. (laughs) It's interesting. I I don't know how you meant that, but I'm receiving it as a compliment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a compliment. I feel like I, you know, I don't know that there's like one Muppet that I specifically identify with. I would say that there are parts of me that feel very like gonzo and parts of me that feel very fozzy, but then also parts of me that feel very Miss Piggy. I would say that there are not parts of me that feel particularly Kermit-y, although he is a little sentimental and I feel like that is for sure a big part of me. But like I find Kermit to be a little bit like he's annoying to me, Mm. but I love Miss Piggy so much and I love gonzo and like I love like I love Fozzie. He's also annoying, but like so funny and great. So I love like the, the core four. I feel, you know, and also I love Janice, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, we've talked a lot about the newer Muppets, and Pepe the Prawn was a oh real running God. thread on this show for a long time. I think you came around to Pepe. I did, I, I did, and I was, you did. We talked about Pepe, and you were like, "I think you should give him another chance." And I was like on some rant about how he was fucking new, and I hated him. And then, not one, not two, but I believe three listeners came out and like DM'd us. On Instagram and on Twitter, I was getting tweets out about like, read this interview with Pepe from like, it's all like it's 15 years old too. So like, get your history, like your facts straight. And listen, I'm not offended. I was into it. I appreciate passion yeah. about no, Pepe Correct the, the record here. Yes. We need the Muppet Wiki folks to come out and correct the record. I will say that like something I find annoying about like any new Muppet that is introduced into the fold is like, it, they are always male Muppets. It's like mm. Bean the Bunny, Pepe the Prawn. Whatever the fuck the character's name is, Walter Waldo, the one who's like in the Muppets with Jason Siegel. It's like they're all just boys or men. And it's like, hello, add a woman Muppet, add a girl. It's 2022. There shouldn't be Miss Piggy and that's it. I have to say, though, I think like I don't remember when Abby Cadabby was added, but I was not into Abby. Yeah, but it's different because she's like a Sesame Street Muppet. So like, yes, they are Muppets, but it's like she's not in like the films, you know, there's a ton of there are a ton of women or women. There are a ton of like female Muppets now on (laughs) Sesame Street, like Zoe, Abby Cadabby, Rosalita. Like there's a lot that since we were kids that have now been introduced. That's true. Sesame Street maybe is doing better with the gender gap than the original Muppets are. Take note. You know, the Muppets are a frequent topic of conversation here. So this week's episode really is just firing on lots of cylinders and answering lots of questions of things that we've talked about here because we got to sit down with the very multi-talented Stephanie DeBruzzo, who, you know, has been a member of the Sesame Street company for almost 30 years, but also, you know, was as a Broadway actor, she was Tony nominated for a performance in Avenue Q. And so we got to talk about like all of the things that are involved in being not a puppeteer, but a Muppeteer. You might know her from Avenue Q, Sesame Street, Elmo's World, Ubi, Scrubs, and the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. We are here with actress, singer, 
puppeteer and Tony nominee, Stephanie DeBruzzo. Stephanie, thank you for joining us on You Might Know Her From. Aw, thanks for letting me come on and chat with you. And you are such a seasoned voiceover actor that you're actually recording from your own booth, which I have to say is very high tech for our show. So we really appreciate you so much. (laughs) I'm glad it's getting some use. Our audience may best know you from your work in the 2004 Tony winning musical Avenue Q or your 28 years as a company member on Sesame Street. But before we get into all of that, we need to ask you about your laundry list of theater credits. I love you because off Broadway title of show at St. Louis Rep. Nuffle Bunny at the Kennedy Center, Carnival at City Center Encores, Greed, a musical of our times at New World Stages, The Winter's Tale at De La Corte Theater. But here's the thing. And Jerry's Girl, where you've said you played Cheetah Rivera's track mostly. So our very important question is, please explain mostly. Well, um, so uh, Pam Hunt, who directed the musicals in Mufti staging of Jerry's Girls at the York Theater in, oh my gosh, was that 2017? It was in 2017, I think, or 2018. I can't remember. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, it's it's, 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 time. It was so fun and it was amazing and just, you know, years. (laughs) So yeah, I think that in the original, Cheetah sang Gucci's song, but she wanted Christine Petty to sing Gucci's song, and instead I, like, there were little, you know, song Tweets. swaps between me and Christine Petty and Stephanie Umo. Just tiny little things, just based on who we were, which was great. It, it worked, you know. And also, we I love Jerry's we the- Girls. Oh, I love that. That show was so fun to do. The music of Jerry Herman is it's not only so fun, it's so singable. Totally. Yeah. It, you know, especially for a character belter like myself. It, it's, and it was so fun to be able to color with every crayon in the box. But again, no matter what song it was, so singable, just so singable, which is great because... Uh, you know, when you're doing a musicals in Mufti, you only have five days to rehearse. Oh, my God. I mean, we were excited to sort of see all of these sort of other musical productions in your history. But when we were learning about you, it sounded like you sort of were determined to become a Muppeteer, like while you were still in college at Northwestern. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like how those early days worked in terms of trying to pursue like an acting career that included puppets and the part of it that didn't and whether or not there was a push and pull there for you sort of like with your training and education? For whatever reason, I applied to and got into Northwestern University. It was the greatest thing to start me on a certain path for many reasons, which will become clear later. And I lived with a lot of like-minded people. We would shoot silly movies at three in the morning. I was involved in a lot of other people's video projects as an actor. And because I was also learning about the other side of the camera, I knew how to act for video. I knew about Mm. continuity. I knew about acting small. And so people used me because also the theater majors were all too busy. And at the same time, I was trying to audition for theater at Northwestern, which is a very competitive program. And of course, I wasn't cast. I learned about being typed out very early on because I had gained the freshman 45 and had a hideous <laughs> late 80s, early 90s perm. Mm, I was I caught in a vicious perm cycle for many years, <laughs> as some people in that era are familiar with. Most of my acting experience at Northwestern was doing student videos. However, at the time, like most college students do, I would watch The Muppets and Sesame Street and Warner Brothers cartoons and Schoolhouse Rock is the little security blanket comfort food that we all do. Mm -hmm. But now I'd always been a Muppet fan as a kid, but now I'm watching it with the mind of a performer. So I'm watching The Muppets and thinking, oh, geez, the guy who's doing Bert. He's also Grover and he's also Fozzie and he's also Miss Piggy and he's also Sam the Eagle. And that guy and oh, my God, Jim Henson, he does Kermit and Ernie and Dr. Teeth and Rolf the dog. And all of a sudden I'm realizing what a great avenue for a character actor and what a great way for me to play all the characters that I want to play without it mattering what I looked like. Mm. So that got me on the path to teaching. I taught myself puppetry for television. I had an epiphany. I said, 
these are the people I want to work for. And it's not because I fell in love with Wiggling the Doll. I fell in love with the character acting and the character driven comedy. Muppets and Sesame Street were doing it better than anybody else. So I was always performing with my face. But puppetry, again, just became this way to do anything. And it could transcend my height, my weight, my gender, my species. So that was very appealing to me. And through many twists and turns of fate, which is a story that's way too long to get into here, I found my way into auditioning for Henson and slowly climbing that ladder. And ever since, there's an interesting thing that I didn't think about when I decided to go down this path. And that was the stigma, not just of puppetry, but of preschool television. But that said, I mean, the thing the thing is, everybody thinks that a kid's book is easier to write than a novel for adults. Everyone thinks that children's television is easier mm. when, in fact, it is much, much harder for many, 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 many reasons. And likewise, people think that puppetry, you know, our job is to make you forget that there's somebody under that character. But it wasn't until... I did Avenue Q and I was out there and people were seeing what I was doing and I was still hearing what real acting have you done mm. Mm. by people in the industry. Mm-hmm. And, and there are people who would you know, be like, oh, well, you're the puppet girl. I would go into a voiceover <laughs> audition and someone would say, well, we don't want anything puppety. And that's not how mm. I approach characters. I, no matter what I do, whether it's a puppet character, an animated vo- a voiceover character, an onstage meat face character, as it were, <laughs> I approach them all from character perspective. But anyway, any choices that I make about performing are basically, hey, you're asking me to do a gig? Yeah, I'm going to do that gig. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, I just really love to perform. I mean, we're going to get into, you know, your extensive work on Sesame Street, but I love hearing, you know, it's fascinating the way that people sort of don't, it sucks the way that people don't take it seriously, because it took, like you said, until Avenue Q for people to sort of see the breadth of what you were doing. Mm -hmm. We also heard this interview where you were talking very fascinatingly to me about how usually, you know, you're used to doing puppetry with your arms above your head. And that because it was a staged reading, you ended up doing the beginning of Avenue Q with it like at your chest level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that that actually changed, people were like, what a bold concept. And you were like, actually, it was for the reading. But then you stayed, like you had to integrate that into a new performance style, which I thought was really fascinating. I don't know that there's a question there, but I thought it was actually really a beautiful way to sort of incorporate the actors into the show. I'm glad that you found that fascinating. It was a fascinating story because the other thing that we didn't realize when we were doing those readings, because originally Avenue Q was going to be a TV show. The the original title was Avenue Q Children's Television for 20-somethings. And that's Mm -hmm. why, one of the reasons why I was brought in to the first readings is because I'd worked on Sesame Street and... um, can then, I interrupt you for a yeah, second absolutely. to just say, like, did Sesame Street have an issue with you doing Avenue Q since it was like essentially a parody of Sesame Street and sort of risque material? So here's what's interesting. At the beginning, and this this was at a really interesting time in the Henson Company history, because at the time we did the first reading in York Theater in 2000, the Jim Henson Company owned all of the Muppet characters right now. All of the Muppet characters are owned by three different entities. The classic Muppet show characters are owned by, and the Bear and the Big Blue House characters are owned by the Walt Disney Company. The Sesame Street characters are owned by Sesame Workshop. And the Fraggle Rock characters, Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, and most everything else is owned by the Jim Henson Company. But at that time in 2000, all of them were under one roof. And I believe... Cheryl Henson had come to one of the early readings. I don't remember who else from Henson had come, but there were a couple of people who had come in the early days. The biggest problem that anybody had was that the first Trekkie monster actually was a green cookie monster with Spock ears and the blue tunic with the Star Trek insignia. And in many ways, in some ways that changed because Cheryl Henson requested that they not have a character look like Cookie Monster. And in some ways, they knew that Paramount would probably sue because of the Star Trek, you know, mm, right, 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 right. similarities. So, you know, they, they didn't have a problem with the design of Rick's characters. And we didn't do what other shows have done in the past, where 
it was a send up of Sesame Street. You know, it yeah. it was a show with puppets that taught lessons to 20 somethings rather than to preschoolers. And and the first version of the show was more breaking the fourth wall. There was a whole thing with the the word of the day is irony. But Sesame Workshop, I am a year to year freelance performer on Sesame Street. That's just the way the puppeteers contracts are, especially because at that time, especially at that time, I wasn't playing a main character on the show. Almost all of the Sesame producers came to the show and loved it. The most ticket requests, the most house seat requests I got was from Gary Nell, the CEO, the then CEO of Sesame Workshop. He was taking okay. the Beaches clients, the sponsors of, of Sesame Street, to the show. So because there was a disclaimer on it saying this is not sanctioned by the Jim Henson Company or by Sesame Workshop, you know, we recommend this is not for children this is a 13 and over show because it wasn't really a parody of Sesame Street. I think so many yeah. people like to just go to the easy explanation of a show. Oh, it's Sesame. It's dirty Sesame Street. No, it's not even dirty puppets. It's it's you know, it's a boy meets girl in the big city story. And it just happens to share life lessons that we all learn in our 20s. And it's done with puppet characters and human characters. It feels familiar because of Sesame Street, but it's not really Sesame Street. So can I set up for our listeners sort of the breadth of your work at Sesame Street? You've been a Muppet performer on Sesame Street since 1993. And then Mm -hmm. in 2015, you took over the role of Prairie Dawn, a role that you inherited from the original Muppeteer, Fran Brill. You also play or have played Lulu, Curly Bear, Elizabeth, Mrs. Crustworthy, Lady Crunchington, Cookie Monster's mom, Grover's mom, Elmo's mom, May, Bert's mommy, Aaliyah Michelle Muppet, and many, 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 many many others. Those are just a few that made me (laughs) laugh. You've done your homework. So knowing that you play or have played so many of characters and have so many voices in your arsenal... Who do you miss playing or who do you like wish was a more primary character? Oh, wow. I, you know, the character Elizabeth that you brought up, she was a character who first showed up in 1997. She was just an anything Muppet who showed up at the end of an episode. There was a whole episode. It was one of those first episode of the season shows where this new kid, Jerome, moves to Sesame Street and he gets introduced to all the characters on the street and he's carrying a picture of his friend from home, Elizabeth. You know, I miss my friend Elizabeth. I wish my friend Elizabeth could be here. And she shows up on the last page. Early on at Sesame Street, you get the breakdowns of the casting because you don't audition for every little role that comes up. You're, you're in this talent pool and the puppet captain at the time, Kevin Clash, you know, he'd be like, oh, this butterfly, that'll be so-and-so. And this talking tomato, that'll be so-and-so. And Elizabeth, okay, that'll be Stephanie. And so I, I see that she shows up on the last page. And her parenthetical before her line was loud. <laughs> Just said loud. And I saw the puppet and she had this fantastic screaming red hair with the blunt bangs and the blunt pigtails and a little parochial school uniform. And I just knew exactly what I wanted to do. And I just came out and I said, hello, Jerome, I'm here, we're visiting. And I had two lines and I guess it was enough of an impact that in two other shows that season, when there was just a generic anything Muppet girl, they plugged Elizabeth in. So Elizabeth was in a tongue twister contest and Elizabeth was at a tea party that Rosita and Baby Bear were throwing. And so she sort of became a a recurring character. And I miss her just because she was loud and brash and not your typical little little girl character. But then I also miss playing... There was an Elmo's World episode where there was a talking jacket. Oh, jacket. And yeah, this yeah, yeah. puppet... <laughs> yeah, and this the hood was the mouth. The eyes were on top of the hood. The sleeves were her little arms. And it was done with rods. It took two, sometimes three people, if the zipper moved up and down, to operate. And I loved this little character. And they brought the jacket back twice in an episode where Zoe, poor Zoe, she was so lonely. 
that she wished her jacket could come to life and play with her. So the jacket fairy came and made her jacket sentient. We didn't use the term sentient. But for all intents and purposes, the jacket became alive. And we did that twice. And no one was on drugs. This is just the way things are in the reality of Sesame Street. So I just, I miss playing little characters like that. So when they have breakdowns, like you just have to send in a reel of like, here's my idea for like Sarah the ghost or whatever for that week. Or they, like, if they're not just casting it, do you have to send in no, 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 your no, ideas? No, 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 no. In production, the scripts for that week are compiled. Someone breaks down all of the characters that are in those week's scripts broken down by day. So we'll get emailed a breakdown. Elmo, Zoe, Big Bird, and then like background butterflies, rocks, blah, 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 blah. And the puppet captain, now Matt Vogel and Martin Robinson, they know us. They know what we do. We've worked together mm. for decades at this point, and they will just say, oh, so-and-so does this, so-and-so does this. Now, sometimes when it comes to, if you're talking about auditioning a voice, that really comes once you're on the set. In the morning, if you're doing either a full read through of the scene or if we're taking it scene by scene, we do it where it's a, you know, read, rehearse, block tape, read, rehearse, block tape, read, rehearse, block tape. So you'll come in, you'll do the quick read on the set, you'll do the voice, and if people laugh, then you know, <laughs> then, yeah. then you know you've got something. Or someone might say, oh, you know, maybe just tone down this part of it, or oh, do you have something else? And we always try to do, at least I always approach characters where I'm always inspired by the look of the puppet. We don't always know what a puppet's going to look like, especially in anything Muppet when we come onto the set. So sometimes we get inspired if a puppet has a has a big giant nose, maybe you want to use that for something, or if, he's, if he's got a big puffy face, you know, or, or if he's got sleepy eyes or wide eyes or whatever. You, you just take these little things because the whole point is to make... The illusion is to make an audience believe that the voice is coming from these non-existent vocal cords of this character. Yeah. And not just any silly voice sounds right coming out of any character, unless you're doing something that's a specific juxtaposition. Uh, you know, let's just take Mike Tyson as an example of that. <laughs> but right, right, right. Okay. to have a little old lady voice come out of a little girl who's supposed to be a genuine little girl doesn't really work. Sure. So we work really hard to maintain the believability of the characters. You know, as a kid who was really obsessed with like girl things, I was obsessed with the Muppets. And when I sort of finally discovered that Miss Piggy and Janice and Camilla yeah. were all performed and voiced by men. I mean, yeah. and I love Frank Oz so much, but oh, sure. it was a disappointment to me that like there weren't women, like it wasn't a woman performing Miss Piggy. Oh. Right. When you joined Sesame Street or became part of the company, like, mm -hmm. did you feel like it was a you were joining a, like, a, and there was a boys club mentality or did it feel like family? Like, did it feel like, you know, you were kind of home immediately? Neither truly, but a <laughs> little of both. Yeah. My audition scenario was specifically looking for women. There was a huge open call in the spring of 1993 looking for women. So I benefited from that search. And there were, you know, a lot of women that came from that audition, a lot of women who were doing things, but they weren't necessarily playing high profile characters. There were two main female characters working on The Muppet Show. They just didn't have major characters. Kathy Mullen and Karen Prell both worked on The Muppet Show, but their characters were not famous or well-known yeah and then when you get there and and again getting there it's not like there's a role that you audition for it's not like the rest of the business you, yeah you get put in this talent pool and they might call you and they might not call you and when you come in you're coming in to this group of people and the thing about the Muppet performers is it's it's like a repertory company it's yeah. so rare to work with a group of people who have worked together for decades. That's just the way it goes. No one has that kind of luxury of knowing the chemistries and the different chemistries that they have with everyone in the room. 
So you're you're going in and you know that by your being there, you're disrupting the chemistry because the, also <laughs> the, our dressing room situation is that we're just in a Muppet room. We're all just, I mean, not in necessarily in COVID times, but historically there's a Muppet room and it's all one room with anywhere from 12 to 25 people on any given day. Sometimes, you know, if it's a small day, maybe eight or six, but you go in and I'm, I'm a shy person. I'm a bold performer, but I'm a shy person. And so I kind of kept to myself. So it didn't feel like family until I was accepted on the floor. It feels kind of like SNL, but yes. you're puppet. You also have this skill set of being a puppeteer. So you're like, you have to be an actor and an improviser and maybe be yeah. able to like write a little bit and be able to sing or be musical a little bit and then yeah. also be a puppeteer. And so it's sort of like some people will rise to the top and be used all the time. And some people yeah. maybe will be utility players and have to prove themselves. It just seems like it's a really specific type of thing that I feel like ex- that, that's what came, comes to mind. It's like kind of like SNL a little bit. Yeah. And the difference is you have someone casting you in those parts a lot you can't write for yourself Mm, unless you have them i mean maybe some people at some point in their career can but definitely not early on you know they can come with ideas but i was never that person or improvising lines on set i can do that now but i couldn't do that then sure or or even playing in between and the thing is no one told me when i started out play in between takes is so important not just for honing your skills on camera but for developing relationships with the other performers and the other characters even if you just have this little anything muppet on who's never going to show up again you should be able to stand your ground as an improvisational character and have a conversation and and sometimes you know people are tired and they don't want to play but sometimes it's just fun and you get caught up in that And I didn't know that that was okay to do for many years. So there is sort of an invisible ladder. The invisible hierarchy, it exists, but it doesn't exist. At least when I came in, it felt like it did. You know, oh, these are legends. I can't possibly do that. May I ask a very, very super specific question, which is... Mm -hmm. Again, kids who are obsessed with, like, girl things. So Betty Lou is another female Sesame Street Muppet that we grew up with. Like, she was of our generation. And, you know, I, like, loved her because she was one of the few girl Muppets uh, on Sesame Street at that time. So that took sort of a two-part question, which is, like, where is Betty Lou? And did you know that there's this whole (laughs) contingency of people online who say she was sort of phased out because she was... Like, essentially, she and Prairie Dawn were not different enough that they could both exist. Like, is there beef between Betty Lou and Prairie Dawn? I don't think there's beef between Betty Lou and Prairie Dawn (laughs) as characters. Originally, they were both played by the great Fran Brill. I don't know the etymology. When I was growing up, I remember I always thought they were like cousins (laughs) because they looked the same. I don't know if that is canon or true. I honestly don't know. And again, I'm I'm not I'm not no, casting this is really shade important. on anyone. But if, but if you but if you look back, it's hard to think that no one had imagination as far as little girls were concerned on the show. They were the same pink blonde yes. little girls. Only one had braids and overalls, and the other yeah, had like a one got a wig and, a, and, and one a had yarn hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the thing about failed characters, and I have had many failed characters. It's never the fault of the performer. It's the fact that sometimes the writers run out of ideas or they think, oh, this character could do it better or we've just run out of things for this character to do. So it sort of fades away. So I don't think anybody ever says we're getting rid of Betty Lou. It's the same thing. Elizabeth was on for three seasons and I don't think anybody ever said we're not going to write for her anymore. Uh, there was a time where the writing staff got called down and the writers who would write for the, the, the characters that I played just were part of the culling. Also, there are times when they say, you know, we really want to focus on our main characters. We want to focus on uh, the tertiary and the secondary characters sort of get less love mm-hmm. just because they're not the main characters. So I don't know exactly why Betty Lou was written off, but I know there's no beef. Prairie did not have her taken care of. Parent trap, a skit. You guys can do a parody. Bring her back. Bring her back. But now, I want to know, because I'm very curious about, so what was it about Betty Lou that 
you enjoyed or like I'm genuinely curious because I don't remember her having for lack of a better word a hook you know like I don't it's interesting I think that it really I mean Anne can attest to this not that we've known each other since we were children but like I just loved all the girls that had like blonde hair as a kid so I love both of them and then I think at a certain point I realized they were not the same character which kind of which kind of tracks for I think the confusion that some folks online were talking about but I'm just like I have a soft spot for her now because I now I know that she's the underdog (laughs) in this situation so I'm like yeah bring her back in and she'll teach kids about blended families if she's like Prairie Dawn's half sister or something you know that that, now that would be interesting the problem is Prairie Dawn's not even on the show that much anymore so (sighs) that would be harder to do Sadly, it is what it is. Are you telling me there's no show Bible for Sesame Street? Because they're just like, that one's gone. We're not like, you know, you go to the Vampire Diaries and they've got like 400 pages on like this person's family tree. There's none of that. So not being a writer on Sesame Street, I cannot truthfully speak to that. I'm sure there is a character Bible somewhere. I mean, I know that at some point that, that Betty Lou and Prairie Dawn were in a style guide from the 70s. But oh as God. far as what's happening today, I don't know how the characters are presented to up and coming writers. But presenting certain things in certain ways, there are reasons why certain characters work for the curriculum of the show and certain characters might might not as much. I do know that a lot of thought is put into the curriculum and what we're going to do But yeah, there always is a focus on the main characters because, and this is something that we've been told, because our audience is mostly three and four year olds, Mm. they don't want to overwhelm the kids with so many characters to keep track of. It's like watching the first episode of Downton Abbey. I remember watching it thinking, this is just, how am I going to keep track of all these characters? (laughs) And I was in my 40s. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I was watching Sesame Street like well into my like 12 years, 12 years old. <laughs> oh, good. That's good. It's good it, content. Yeah, 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 well, hey, I mean, all, all over again, you know, people discover things that we've been doing for years. Like it's that whole Elmo, Zoe, Rocco thing that's just blown up. They've been doing that for, you know, almost 20 years and people have just discovered it like it's brand new. So we try to make it as fun as possible. It's just we have to make room for the... For the real stuff it's still going viral it's still like excellent programming so thank you for honoring all of our questions yeah i don't even Sesame know Street. if i've answered them have no, i no, no, did i have. did i satisfy yeah we're bringing betty lou back that's what i got out of it uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay so stephanie you have this great bit on the unbreakable kimmy schmidt as kimmy's oh. lost backpack jan s port oh. who had kept kimmy company while she was in the bunker so you know this character was reunited with kimmy in season four but mm-hmm. you almost got like kimmy almost virginia wolfed you meaning like putting rocks in you and <laughs> sending you out into the hudson <laughs> oh. it was such a great arc because it Wasn't was sort it? of oddly dark but also sweet and emotional yes. so as a puppeteer i know you've said you're just playing the character and you act opposite humans on sesame street all the time yeah. but did you approach this sort of scene work with ellie kemper any differently since there was this pathos to it and the tone of kimmy schmidt was so like theatrically absurd no i didn't approach it differently at all because think about it i'm playing a backpack <laughs> the yeah. only thing i really had to do is know the show And I fortunately had been watching the show. And when you think about it, I mean, if you really think about it, all I had to do was think about Kimmy. Because essentially, Jan is Kimmy. Jan is Kimmy's Mm -hmm. id and ego and all these things. She is a creation of Kimmy. So what I needed to do for this backpack is imbue her with that same spirit and pathos and giant beating heart that is Ellie Kemper's performance. Not mimicking it, certainly, but at least having that same energy going into Mm -hmm. it. I hadn't seen the backpack when I did the voice audition, but what I did wound up being kind of similar to what I did on the floor. It was really more about the attitude. You so much of puppetry and and even and you know and, and voice acting as well is not just about the vocal quality, but about the cadence and the, and the intensity and the energy of it. Uh, you could do the exact same nasal voice, but if you say it a certain rhythmic way or a certain intensity or a certain approach, 
you can have multiple really strong characters from that quote unquote same voice. So approaching Kimmy Schmidt, again, it was about the character. What's this what's this character look like? Does it sound like this character would come out of it? But all of the emotion behind it, all the stuff, it was just all I had to do was color in the lines that Tina Fey and Robert Carlock and all those great people working on that show had already sketched out. I had to fit into that world. And I was lucky that I that I could do that. I, but, but what I really loved, when I read the scene in the sides, I thought, oh, they're not doing this. Oh, they are. And you don't get that with puppet roles. Like, you right. don't get to play that dark. It, it, it's almost like you just had to play it as straight as possible to make it work. Because it was already ridiculous on so many yeah. levels. It's a backpack. She's talking. And now Kimmy is going to kill her. <laughs> She's bargaining. Like, the backpack is bargaining and realizes it. And it, it's just, it was so satisfying to play it. Because it's also something I don't get to play very often. Totally. And thankfully, the, the, the show was, was great about play. And, and Ellie Kemper is just, I mean, she's a dang delight. It's such a great episode. It's so funny. Please go watch it. Stephanie, you left Avenue Q to do the off-Broadway show I Love You Because, which you mm-hmm. said actually led to your role as Patty Miller in the musical episode of the sitcom Scrubs. In that yes. episode, you play a patient who starts hearing everyone's speech as singing. And then you would go on to appear, I believe, in two more episodes, a cameo as Patty in the series finale. But then you also yes. appear as a Muppet in an episode where J.D. is like having a Sesame Street fantasy. Yes. You've said that Scrubs was one of the few times you've acted on film and TV as yourself, not with a yes. Muppet. Was it yes. freeing to go into that guest role and not have a puppet or was it scary or like or both? I mean, it's scary because it was my first network television guest shot. So, yeah. But at the same time, it was a show. You're like the lead of the episode. Well, (laughs) there's so many. No, 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 no. (laughs) Ken Jenkins said to me during rehearsals, I'm laying on the gurney because we had a week of rehearsals before we shot the show. It was great. I got to spend so much time with these people. And I was such a fan of the show going in. And I think that helped. I knew the show. I remember him saying to me, you know, if they don't believe you, then we don't have a show. If they're not on that ride with you, like day one, I'm like, oh, no pressure here. Any nervousness that any actor would have about doing their first network guest shot, you'd have. But as far as getting to play myself versus a puppet, the only difference is, oh, maybe I shouldn't eat so much salt, you know. (laughs) And the only reason I got to do it was because when I did I Love You Because, the writer of my musical, Deborah Fordham, big musical theater fan, she would come to New York, you know, and see a bunch of shows. She saw me in I Love You Because. She had seen me in Avenue Q. But then she saw me in I Love You Because without the puppet and thought, huh. And she thought of me, for whatever reason, when she wrote the episode, pitched me to Bill Lawrence Thankfully, nobody bigger, I guess, was available. I don't know how this all happened, but there, by the grace of Deb Fordham, did I get to do the episode. And we became really good friends, which is how I got to do the Sesame episode. So when the Sesame episode happened, there was going to be... uh, Deb didn't write it. I don't think she did. But, you know, she's on staff and knows what's going on and and she had mentioned that this episode was coming up. I'm like, ah, oh, man, it'd be great, but I'm never going to get to do it because I'm not a main character. And they were going to cast the little, you know, one-line x-ray patient as a local, as an L.A. local. And they said, if you can work as a local, you can do it. We'd love to have you back. So Deb let me stay with her. And <laughs> love it. So that's, yeah. Love and Deb. And the same thing with the finale, being an extra in that great scene with all those people who'd been on the show over the years if you can come out and work as a local we'd love to have you and so again deb put me up and god love her that's Mm. how i got to have my relationship with that show and i'll always be grateful and cherish it i've been very lucky 
Well, I'm glad that we ended on that note because we are entering the part of the show that we like to call the rapid fire. It's going to be Uh rapid for us. You can take as much time as you need. If you want to be rapid, be rapid. Okay. So we are going to hearken back to those 2004 Tonys. So on your website, Stephanie, you have this great section called Enjoyments and Embarrassments. (laughs) And under Embarrassments, you mentioned that during that era, the Best Actress nominees were featured on the cover of Time Out New York, except you. They put you on the inside cover and there was some issue about like they wanted to have you with the puppet. One, fuck them. Two, did you tell them to fuck off? And three, of those four other nominees, which woman most seemed to have a hand up her ass? Adina Menzel, Tanya Pinkins, Kristen Chenoweth, or Donna Murphy? I can't say a bad word about any of those women. <laughs> I, I can't. Like, not, not, I'm not saying I wouldn't dare. I'm saying <laughs> I can't. Because they were good. They were good. They were wonderful. Okay. It wasn't their fault. You know, I don't think any single one of them said, I won't do this if Stephanie's here. They didn't know. (laughs) I mean, by all accounts, they didn't know. Uh, And I was still so new to the theater world that, uh, you know, the rationale was, oh, it's the new divas and she's not an established diva. And, uh, you know, I I knew the score. And again, I think it goes back to stigma. And I had been self-deprecating about the category. I mean, I started calling myself the Professor and Marianne. As soon as the nominations came out, because I really was and the rest, because it really was a I mean, it was ridiculous to be included with these just powerhouse legendary women. At the same time, it stung that twice the New York Times referred to me as the Dennis Kucinich of Mm. the best actress race. And the great thing about being nominated for an award is that no one's lost until they lose. Except in this case, people made me feel like I'd lost before I lost. I had no illusions that I would win, but at least give me the time of no one's won this yet and no one's lost this yet. That made me feel like a loser. And that just brought me back to middle school. And no one wants that. Of course. That sucks because also Fine Fine Line is like musical theater canon at this oh. point. You know, well, yeah, like, but so are all the songs that those women sang. I mean. Sure, sure, sure. But like they, anyway, you were excellent and also like making headlines and that show was such a huge success. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. And I appreciate that now. You know, there is no one thing you can do that suddenly makes the business all better. Boy, this is so not rapid fire. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I, honestly, we love your website so much. Please go oh. to the website. It is so funny and so charming, and there's so oh, many goodies there. Thank you. It's all me, so that means a lot. I had no ghostwriter. We are obsessed with the segment on Sesame Street where Patti LaBelle sings the ABCs. Listeners, if you haven't seen it before, <gasps> pause and go watch it. I honestly, my whole Fire Island house, we pass around a bottle of poppers and we watch it, and I always was oh. like, stare at Prairie Dawn. I think this was 1998, so I assume that Fran Brill is operating Prairie Dawn in that particular scene. Were you on the floor Muppet, though, while Patty was belting? I was doing Zoe. (gasps) For a long time, I thought I was Prairie, right? Because my memory remembers it differently. But then I went back and I'm like, no, I was Zoe. I was behind the piano. But because of the things that happened near Prairie Dawn, and I will tell you a secret, and I don't know whether you know the secret. There there are two secrets of that amazing performance. <laughs> I can't handle this. One, there were cue cards. <laughs> For the okay. ABCs. Yes. But I think that's because the legendary great Patti LaBelle would get so caught up in the music that I think it would be easy to lose one's place. Do you know what I mean? Because it starts yeah. out very slow. Yeah. So the biggest secret is that in the middle of one of the takes, Bert's eye falls off. <gasps> <laughs> and Noel McNeil, who played Bear in the Big Blue House, and he was Keiko on Ubi and has been a puppeteer and does mascots on Last Week Tonight, he was in Bert uh, because, uh, yeah, and... And the eye fell off. And if you'll notice at one point, so they cut to a close up of Patty. And then toward the end of the song, you'll notice that you only see Bert in profile. (laughs) Because Noel is trying to hide the fact he's trying to keep the missing eye upstage. Oh, my God. Okay. (laughs) Wow. But at one point, his back is to the camera because I'm trying to remember it was his right 
eye. <laughs> but he was looking in a certain direction. So then at one point he swings around really fast to look at Patti LaBelle because you can't end the song without looking at Patti LaBelle. And you don't ever see that there's no eye. But at one point you can tell that Fran in Prairie is trying to stack in front of Bert to block wow. where the, but she's too short to believably be that tall to block the eye. So for a long time, I thought I was Prairie because I remember watching, you know, we're all watching monitors as we're performing. So I'm watching this action happen and not really focusing on the character I was playing. But then I realized <laughs> later on, no, that's not my puppetry. That's my puppetry. I was Zoe. So I was there and it wow. was amazing. Look, and she did it in two takes. And the only mm, reason I, I think it. we did it in two takes is because of the eye. But then they cut the two together. <laughs> Like because also, the performance she's like legit, was so like it, good. It's like it is the most incredible performance oh. on children's television. It's yeah. so cool. Yeah, she's singing live and like it's just mm. glorious. <laughs> okay, your character Uma on the Noggin show Ubi was just your hand with eyeballs and a brett on top of your knuckles. For the year that you were on that show, were you able to write off your manicures and hand lotion budget? They did pay for waxing and manicures. <gasps> waxing your knuckles? Well, my arm. I'm Italian. I have very oh hairy my, knuckles. But I never I'm a freaking Italian with that. Okay. woman. <laughs> since <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. then, since then, the home laser has taken care of that. But at the wow. time, and I hated it. Waxing was awful. I, it didn't do jack. It was terrible. But after a while, uh, at one point, Ubi was happening during Avenue Q. The second season of Ubi... Because, I, again, I never left Sesame Street to do Avenue Q. I just needed a hard out at 530. But they just stopped using me as often. But Ubi, I was a main mm-hmm. character. So what they would do is we, d- we didn't have a weekday matinee. At that time, our, our two show days were Saturdays and Sundays. So during the week, you know, we didn't have a show on Monday night. And then Ubi would do a show without Uma on Wednesdays. So I would only have three days a week where I would have to do double duty. At that time, I just didn't have time to get a manicure. There was just no time to do it. So I did it myself. But I never thought about writing off the hand lotion. I just always have like hand cream around because just always. So that was a thing. Okay. Stephanie DeBruzzo, last question. Yes. If you had to be stuck in an elevator for four hours with one of these famous puppeteers and their puppet, who would you choose? Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. Sid and Marty Croft and H.R. Puff and stuff, or Waylon Flowers and Madam? Waylon Flowers and Madam. I would absolutely, I'd want to hear Hollywood Squares stories. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> I'd, I'd want to, I'd, I would want to hear about the experiences. I mean, it might get a little much with Madam, but I think even Waylon Flowers would take <laughs> off Madam after a while and just say, you know what, let's just talk. Because I'm tired. <laughs> I can only do this for so long. Stephanie DeBruzzo, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for being so nice. I did not know what to expect when I came in to chat with you both. <laughs> it's been lovely to meet you, and thank you for not being mean oh and God. making fun of me. And oh my gosh, your research. You did your homework, like major homework. It is one of the great thrills of this podcast that we get to have something that is a shared, beautiful thing between Damien and I that we then get to bring to a guest. And that is, of course, the Patti LaBelle singing mm. the ABCs on Sesame Street, getting to hear the behind the scenes of Patti LaBelle, two takes, cue cards, Bert's eye falling out. Like, this is what we're here for. If you haven't watched the clip, if you didn't pause the episode to do it, I'm telling you once more, go watch the clip. It's one of the greatest things in all. It's like why YouTube is invented. Thank God it exists for posterity. Thank God. Also, I'm very into the fact that Stephanie essentially taught herself puppeteering because I remember as a kid at the public library when my mom would be gone I would have you know 45 minutes an hour to myself to explore the library and pick out whatever I want when I was older that would be me going and like masturbating (laughs) privately to Dennis Rodman's autobiography in the corner (laughs) just rocking back and forth gently on the floor but as a younger person that would be me asking the librarian to help find books about ventriloquism so I could teach myself ventriloquism because it was my greatest goal as a child (laughs) Can you throw your voice? Like, I know that's not, 
I can't throw my voice at all. I really did try her a long time, though. And I really worked hard at not moving my mouth. I know this is an audio, like this is an oral medium, so no one can see me moving my mouth. I but I really did of, try I think, hard. I think most kids at some point tried it, honestly. He asked me. Did you do it, too? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't have the uh, discipline to teach myself any skills, period. <laughs> what are your talents, Damien? Well, I love to talk. <laughs> Is it a talent? <laughs> I can watch four and a half movies in <laughs> one sitting. <laughs> I know how to Google. I know how to find someone's phone number on the internet with just knowing <laughs> their first name and the city they live in. If I can find them on, you know. <laughs> whatever <laughs> like these are my talents so yes i'm super yeah. impressed with stephanie DeBruzzo's discipline and dedication and also just like her enormous talent i mean it just feels like a embarrassment of riches i'm jealous also if you haven't been to kaufman astoria studios out in queens which is where sesame street has been shot i think for the last like 30 years it hasn't always been there but for the most of its last tenure it has been there and I lived in Queens for years and one of my favorite memories is going to the Astor Room it was like this bar that's right next door it used to be the mess hall that is attached to Kaufman Astoria the old movie studio from the 30s but now it's sort of this fancy restaurant anyway I got to know the bartender and I became friends with the people that ran the place and one night I came home very drunk and I would always just stop in on my way home and say hi to the bartender or like have a nightcap and I it was really run pretty shoddily back in the day, which is why I loved it. And the bartenders let you do whatever you want. And so I came in and it was still open at like 2.30 in the morning. I walked in and bartender Michael Sheets was not there. I said, Mike, hello, Mike, where are you? Aren't you closing? Like the door was wide open. I should probably not say his last name. <laughs> <laughs> no, I you walk you in, I walk into the bar, I'm really drunk. And then I see that like the door leading to like whatever the back of the kitchen is open. So I walk in there and I realize I'm sort of in the back of house. And then I keep walking. I'm like, Mike, hello. And then I see steps downstairs. And then I'm like, I'm taking them. I'm taking those steps down. I was very brazen. So walked downstairs, opened a door and realized as I walked through the second door, which was glass, that I was inside Kaufman Astoria (gasps) Studios. And it was 2.30 in the morning. (laughs) I was wasted. And now it, I appeared that I may have been breaking and entering, which I definitely was not trying to do. I was just trying to say hi to my friend. And I started walking through and then I saw like Sesame Workshop signs. And then there were like dressing rooms. And I was like, oh my God, I'm literally in Sesame Street, like at 2.30 in the morning. It was the most incredible thing. And I was like, this is my life. Can you believe it? And then I got really scared that there were security cameras on me and I hightailed it out of there. So I didn't do anything, didn't touch anything, ran away. But it was one of the highlights of my life that I got to see Sesame Street after dark, essentially. You didn't tell Stephanie that piece of information. I didn't. I didn't think she needed to know, but maybe she knows now. One other note I just wanted to comment on in, in, in talking about our conversation with Stephanie was the Betty Lou of it all. You know, I oh, I went to look yes. up photos of Betty Lou and, and Prairie Dawn after, you know, we were <laughs> while we were doing the edit. And I was like, uh, what? I found a photo of the two of them, like, walking in the woods. And I was like, and Prairie Dawn has, like, a pixie cut at the time. And they're both in, like, dungarees carrying <laughs> twigs. And I was like, they look gay. Like, they look less like sisters or, like, the same person as I feel like we talked about in the interview and literally look like maybe they're lovers. <laughs> they're like, yeah, what's if it. they're on, like, a trip? Like, it's like they're, like, foraging, you know? It's like when you pull yeah. berries off the, on, like, that's what it looked like. It looked like you and Hannah on a walk in the park. Right. We pulled the car over on the side of the highway because we saw a nice rail trail. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, shout out to Betty Lou and Prairie Dawn because they're family. Ah, oh, folks. I hope that you enjoyed this interview as much as we did. We love diving deep on all things Muppetry. But we wanted to take a second to thank some of the people that have come out of the woodwork in the last couple of weeks to just say thank you for the podcast, which we so appreciate. Send us names, send us recommendations. And so we love hearing from you. Thank you for sticking through this whole transition that we've had to go remote during the pandemic. And now we're hoping, we still haven't done our our in-person interview back with an actress yet, but we're hoping that that is on the horizon. So we just wanted to shout out a few of the people that have really come through, leaving 
leaving reviews, sending us DMs. We see you and we thank you so much. I just really wanted to thank the following people. And it's important that you know that a gay rabbi follows us. Thank you, Rabbi Jessica. It is very important that we have a gay rabbi in our corner. So thank you. God, I'm such a dyke for promoting our Rachel Shelley post and sending us love. We so appreciate you. Tony, thank you for your lovely note about the Jody Long interview. We love talking to her, too. And reminder that her one-woman show is opening Bucks County Playhouse this summer. Also, thank you to Heathcliff Heathcliff and Joey T for both of your suggestions. Also, thank you to James. I am so appreciative that you are also on the Kim Cattrall train and are trying to find ways to bring her back on to season two. of And just like that, I am certain that Michael Hedrick King is listening to this podcast and knows what to do <laughs> if he knows what's good for him. <laughs> Folks, follow in the footsteps of these fine people and leave us a five-star review on the Apple Podcast app. That's the best thing you can do to boost us to the top of the algorithm and help us get in front of more people so that we can keep doing this thing that we love to do for you, for us, for the women who deserve to have these like full length interviews. That's what we love doing. So if you can leave us that five star review with some words, an emoji, a name will do. We love you. Thank you so much. Now let's get down to brass tacks. Damien, I need you to do what we do, which is connect this week's guest, Stephanie DeBruzzo to next week's guest via a series of actor connections. Can you do it for us? You know what? I think I'm up to the task. Stephanie DeBruzzo was in Avenue Q with former guest of this show, Anne Harada. Anne Harada played Linda, the stage manager on Smash, which also featured another former guest of this show, Becky M. Baker, who of course played Karen Cartwright's mother. Becky was also Hannah's mom on Girls with Allison Williams. Allison Williams was in that terrible live production of Peter Pan <laughs> with Minnie Driver, who was full of beans in the Boston-based film Conviction, <laughs> which also starred Gina Gershon, who was in Showgirls with Elizabeth Berkley, who of course starred on Saved by the Bell, which Leanna Creel also controversially starred as Tori, Leanna Creel, alongside her triplets Joy and Monica, also starred in The Parent Trap 3 with next week's guest. And Who? baby, we are leading with one of her most esoteric <laughs> credits. So get into it. That made me feel really alive. That <laughs> review of Mini Driver, having Mini Driver be called full of beans in Entertainment Weekly is one of the best things I've ever seen put in print. What a beautiful thing to bring that to our audience. So folks, there are some things that are just emblazoned in my brain. One of them was that Entertainment Weekly description of Jennifer Connelly having dirt in her hair that we got to bring to Shrek <laughs> Dashlu. Another one of them was the review that they did for conviction where they said that Minnie Driver's accent was full of beans and me and Anne laughed about it for about five hours. I actually remember being on the set of Very Mary Kate, like passing it back and forth because we had discovered it and we just couldn't stop laughing about it. So God bless EW for serving those two pieces of information that I will never forget. Oh, it doesn't exist anymore. It's only online. R.I.P. Folks, if you think we're full of beans and like what we're doing here, please find us on social media. You can follow my best friend, Anne, over here. You can find her on everything at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. And you can find me anywhere and everywhere at Damian Bellino. You might know her from is produced by us, Anne Rodeman and Damian Bellino. And we want to thank our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment, Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears, for all the work that they do for us. They are the ones that keep us on track, on time, full of beans, moving forward. <laughs> All of the editing that you hear on each and every episode of You Might Know Her From is courtesy of our excellent editor, Daniel Sears. Thank you, Daniel, as always. Also, shout out to Gang. Thank you, Gang. You are full of beans. And all that music you hear underscoring each and every episode of You Might Know Her From is by Gang. You can download and stream Gang wherever you listen to your music. And if you need to see a screenshot of that review <laughs> that lists Mini Driver's accent as full of beans we're going to put it in the show notes that's where that clip of patty labelle is going to reside and it's what we spend our time on we put a lot of effort into it so that all of those things are right at your fingertips we never talked about annalyn mccord doing like <gasps> a spoken word oh my god poem that is in response shocking. to the tragic events that are happening in the ukraine she wished that she was Putin's mother. Oh, my God. She read, like, spoken word poetry. The first couple stanzas rhymed, and then it, she just went off the rails. Well, I mean, it was off the rails from the beginning. A little backstory. Damien and I watched the 90210 reboot on CW called 90210, not to be confused with BH90210 that started the original cast. The 90210 
CW show was surprisingly good. Jessica Walter was on it. She was great. Wasn't it Lori Laughlin? Oh, mm. wasn't it Lori Laughlin? The disgraced Laughlin? Lori yeah. Laughlin and Rob the Estes. Played the I was pair. about to say R.I.P., but it's, you know, essentially. I think she's back, actually. Anyway, Annalyn McCord was one of our favorites. She sort of played the, like, bad girl villainous, but, like, frenemy of, of the main girls. And she was, there was something about her that Damien and I both loved. And then she really hasn't been making headlines until this Putin video. And then I went to her Twitter and I realized that what she is doing is similar to like a maybe Julianne Huff scenario where she is like sort of trying to be like a guru y self help advocate type. And it's very intense. It seems very troubled. And then I think she didn't apologize for the video or acknowledge that it was strange at all. So. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, that's what Sinead Grimes does to a person. <laughs> Do you remember when Julianne Huff had that like energy pulled out of her asshole? Of course. It's my favorite thing. It's one of the clips that I send to people when they say, Julianne Huff, who's that? <laughs> I'm not going to send you Dancing with the Stars. I love her. She's, she's cuckoo. Not my Sandy. I love Grease Live, so it's like, you know what? She's okay by me. She can have energy pulled out of her ass <laughs> until the cows come home. I love her. She also compared Jojo Siwa and Dancing with the Stars to Joan of Arc, so she's good in my book. <laughs> 